Hi, my name is Chris Bochamp and I'm a mobile developer with Key Cloud. And this is the fourth part in a video series on building an iOS game using SpriteKit and Key Cloud. If you missed the first videos for this series, uh, check out the comments or the description below and you'll be able to find links to the first three. And I definitely recommend checking those out if you want to know a little bit more about the project and especially if you're a first time SpriteKit developer. But we're going to assume here that you're all caught up and ready to go. Uh, so let's dive right into the code. To show where we left off here, we'll do a quick build and run. And make it a little easier to read here. I guess that's okay. So we've got our six by seven grid of blocks on our screen. And when you click on one of these blocks, all of the connected colors will disappear and we'll have some new blocks fall from above the screen. So it's actually becoming a nice little gameplay here. So what's missing? Well, we want to be able to track score and we need a way to both start and end the game. So otherwise this just goes on indefinitely and blocks keep falling from the sky. So we want to add a score so we can basically compete with ourselves to see if we can better our score. So when we go into the code, the first thing that we're going to do is create a new either, and this is going to be an SK label node, and we'll call it score label. And an SK label node, if you're a, a used to iOS development, it's it's kind of like a UI label, but it's particularly for Sprite Kit, and it's a node, so it it fits nicely into the scene. And we're going to create the actual object. Uh, here in our initialization method, and that'll look something like this. Now, if you're coming from regular iOS programming, you'll notice that a lot of these look familiar to the UI label. So you can set the text, the font color, the font size, and you'll notice just, there are just a few minor differences between even things like alignment. So we'll go ahead and add this to our scene and build and run to see what it looks like. Okay, and down here at the bottom, you can see we've got our score label showing up in the bottom left. But when we play, nothing happens. So we need to make that score label dynamic as we play the game. And we'll do that by creating a class variable, another iVar up here. And it'll be an integer that just tracks the score or the number of blocks that have been destroyed. So to be able to track the score, we'll go down to our touch method. And for every node that's being deleted or every block that's being removed from the screen, we're going to update our score just by adding one. So we'll just use the incrementer here. And we also want our label to update, so we'll set our score label text to the current score. Now let's see what happens. So notice our score still starts at zero, but we're going to click this block of three and there are score updates to three. We'll click this block of four and it should go right up to seven, and it does. So we want to format it a little bit more nicely and keep it consistent, so we need to prepend score there. And now the user will know what they're seeing. And you start smashing all these blocks and your score keeps going up and up and up. So looking pretty good. But right now, the game just kind of goes on forever and your score will just keep going up until you get sick of playing. And that doesn't make for a fantastic game. So we want to add a timer to this game. So you're only playing the level for a set amount of time. And you're trying to get as much score as you can before the time expires. So we'll go in and just like how we added the score label, we'll add a timer label as well. So we'll pretty much just copy and paste these. and initialize this, the timer label. And instead of score, of course, we want time. 
and we'll align it on the right hand side and change our X position slightly to throw it on the other side of our floor. So now when we build and run, we should be able to see a timer label on the right. And there it is, but it's hiding behind this uh, frames per second and node count that we have. So since this, this label here is great for debug mode, uh, so being able to see your frame count, your frame rate and, and node count, it's very, very helpful, but we don't need it right now. Uh, so let's dive in and turn it off. And for this, it's actually in the view controller. So this will be the first time that we venture into view controller uh, since we started. And you'll see the sprite kit view uh, where we have a couple attributes here, shows FPS and shows node count. And we're gonna comment both these out because we, we don't want that on the screen. We wanna be able to test our timer label. So if we build and run again, uh, that, that frame rate and the node count has disappeared. So now let's go back into our code in our scene and we're going to create another constant up here. And this is how long the level time, the level will last or how, how much time will be on the timer when you start playing the game. And we'll start with five because we wanna be able to test it in a short amount of time. Now, before we actually go in and implement the timer, there's something that we wanna track throughout the game and that is the game state. So whether or not the user is, is currently playing or if the game is stopped. So what we'll do is we'll create a, a type def here. And we'll call it game state. And within the game state, we'll have a few variables or constants rather. And we'll have stopped, starting and playing. So those will be the three states that our game can be in uh, for, for what we're trying to accomplish here. So now we'll create a couple of, of class variables here. Uh, the first will be tracking that game state. And the second will be a time interval, uh, and we'll call it started time. And this is one of the ways that we'll be able to track how much time has passed and be able to keep up with our timer and our counter. So where do we go in to change the game state? When do we want the game to start? Well, just for simplicity's sake, let's have the game start as soon as the user clicks on one of the blocks. So let's head down to the, our touches method and find, okay, so here the user has clicked on one of the blocks. Let's actually put it in here, uh, which is they clicked on a block that's valid to be destroyed. So it's one of its neighbors is the same color as it is. So we'll mark this as the official start to the game. And we wanna keep track of this through our game state variable. So what we'll do is say, if the game state is stopped, well, then we wanna go ahead and start it. So we'll say it's starting now. And the reason we use starting instead of playing here is because we want the game to be able to update itself, uh, specifically the timer. So we wanna know when the timer should start. So now that we've marked the game state as starting, we can go down to our update method. And remember, this is drawn before every frame is rendered. And what we wanna do here is check to see if the game state is starting, which is set when the user first taps on a valid block. And if it is starting, then we wanna be sure to start our timer. So we'll set the started time equals the current time. And the current time is denoted by this variable right here, this parameter in the update method. So the game will keep track of the current time and we'll utilize that for our timer. And if the game state is starting uh, and we're good to go here, we'll change the game state to playing. since the game has already started and the user is off and running. Now the next thing we wanna do here is actually update the UI and let the user know how much time they have remaining. So in this update method, every time the game state is currently playing, we're gonna figure out how much time the user has left. And we'll do that with this bit of code right here. And now that we know how much time is left, we can go ahead and update our label.
All right, so let's build and run and see if our timer is working. So right now it's at zero and it should go up to five as soon as we start our game. And it does, and it's counting down every second. So it's looking pretty good. But now we're getting into negative numbers because our game doesn't know when to stop. Our timer doesn't know when to stop. So we need to dive in and add a little bit of logic to let the game know when it's, when it's done. So we'll do that here in our update method as well. And we only want to alert the game that it's done if it's currently playing and the time expires. So we'll figure out if our time left is zero. And if it is, that means our user's out of time and we need to end the game. So we'll change the game state to stopped. And we'll call a method that we haven't quite created yet, but we will, called game ended. Now we're creating this method called game ended just because we envision in the future that the user might want to end the game for other reasons. They might hit pause and then quit. You know, there, there are many places that we might want to call this from. So we don't want to embed the logic within this update method. So we'll just extract it into its own method. And it'll make things a little bit cleaner as well. So we'll create this game ended method and make sure that our game state is stopped here. This might be a better idea. And then we can take it out of here because anytime the game ends, our game state needs to go back to stopped. And then what we'll do is create a message for our user to see. And we'll show this message to the user via an alert view. and we'll show this view to the user. So now if we pop back in and try our game out, at the end of our five seconds, we should get an alert with the final score. Let's see how many we can get here. So this time we got 38. Notice our timer's at zero, our score's at 38, and that's the game. Now let's say we want to start a new game. Well, we should just be able to start clicking. Ah and our timer counts down, but our score went up from where it was below. So we need to go back in and reset our score once the game is over. So we'll do that here in this game ended method. Uh, and since we're using the score variable here, we'll do it at the end and we'll reset the score to zero. So this, this will reset the score every time the game's over uh, to get it ready for the next one. So here we'll play another game and see if we can beat 38 this time. 39, perfect. <laughs> and we'll hit OK and be done. And now if we start again, our score goes back to zero and resets. So we've got some pretty good game logic happening here. And that's actually where we're going to leave it for this one. Uh, in the next, in the fifth iteration of this, of this tutorial, will go in to create a leaderboard that's based in the cloud so you can compete with your friends and see how you stack up against everybody else in the world that's playing this game. And we're going to utilize Key Cloud for that, so it's going to make it very, very easy. And we can actually add a fully functional scoreboard in a matter of a few minutes. So definitely check that one out. As I've mentioned before, this entire game is based, is an open source project, and it's all in our GitHub page. So if you go to the link that's here, you can go and check out all the code that you want. And specifically, if you check out the tag tutorial-4, you'll be able to get the exact snapshot from the end of this tutorial. Uh, so you can follow along and, and work with that, with this exact code, rather than seeing the source code for the entire game once we start adding on new features and, and doing more to this game down the road. So check out our GitHub page and let us know what you think. Thanks a lot for joining us, and we'll see you next time.